Good afternoon, everyone. We are so happy that you are all here today. I want to say welcome to all of you. And also, uh, we are honored to have our panel who will be speaking with us. We're very pleased that they're here to help us kick off the dialogue about our, our cognitive policy. And I'm one of the county commissioners, Matt Coleman and the family. Uh, Will will join us a little bit later. We just have a couple things that we'd like to share with you before we start into the program. And um, for those of you who've been around Baltimore County a long time, you know that agriculture is a very important industry here in the county. And there's a long history of agriculture here in Baltimore County. And, um, the two, two biggest industries were farming and mining, and in particularly my family, we came here because of both farming and mining in the 1880s. And that farmland uh, actually for us is near Lafayette. It was an 80 acre farm. It was a diversified operation for many, many years and fed three families through some trying times in the 20s and 30s and 40s. It's still a farm at the moment, but um, as you know, it's very difficult to, to keep farmland in the front range. And so um, the, the mining aspect is a little bit different. That was a lot of coal mining, that sort of thing. And the two industries went hand in hand over many years until relatively recently. And um, as we looked at agricultural land across the county over the years, um, we noticed that it was disappearing, just like every other place in the village. And 30 years ago, a whole group of people put together some great thoughts. They created a comprehensive plan here in Boulder County that was focused on preserving at least some of that agricultural land and preserving the agricultural lifestyle so that we don't completely lose the heritage that um, this county grew from. That comprehensive plan um, helped guide the way for us to preserve quite a few acres here in Boulder County, actually 25,000 acres. They're currently farmed by small farm, farmers and ranchers. And just as a, there we go, just as a, a way to um, understand what 25,000 acres looks like, it's around 40 square miles. It's uh, approximately the size. That's a lot of acreage. And of course, as you know, that land helps buffer our cities. It helps keep our towns and municipalities um, independent from one another. It contributes to the quality of life here in Boulder County in huge ways. It makes a huge difference. So we know we're on the right track with that comprehensive plan and with the, the open space strategies that we have and putting our efforts into preserving farmland and certainly in preserving the agricultural way of life. But as we look at those 25,000 acres, um, particularly in regard to some discussions that happened last year, we realized that we need to talk about the cropland policies and strategies that we want to have in place in Boulder County going into the future. How should those 25 thousand acres of farmland be farmed. And um, last year a very long discussion happened around sugar beets, what kind of sugar beets should be grown, and um, what it means if you don't grow them or if you do grow them. And so that has led us to looking at a framework um, need for a cropland policy. That is why we've created a cropland policy advisory committee to help us work through the process. That group will examine all the issues and lay out the framework for how decisions will be made in the future around our cropland usage in the open space acres that we have. And we're excited to, to kick off the dialogue, have a long discussion about it. It was one of the most challenging hearings I think we've ever been in. Certainly for me, I had been in the office about two years before we jumped into this discussion. And it brings about every aspect of human life into the discussion that you can think of. And some of you have probably already thought about that. Um, but um, that's part of why we're here today, to start talking about what that framework should look like. And we're very happy that you're here to share the dialogue. And, and I'll just add that I think it goes without saying that food is important to all of us, as are our landscapes, the quality of our, of our environment. And this set of discussions concerns all of that. And, um, we're lucky enough to be in a position in Boulder County where we have, over the last uh, couple of decades, preserved this 25,000 acres of land, and we have the opportunity to decide how it's going to be managed. And I think that's something that's very different than most communities across the Front Range, and, and we're, we're very lucky to be in this position. Nonetheless, it is a challenging set of issues, and our goal of, as a county is to come up with a path towards sustainable agriculture for the county. We need to have these agricultural lands be productive on into the future. Um, and not just uh, for the values that they provide for wildlife on the edges and um, the, the value for buffering between communities, but our food. Um, we believe that um, local food is going to be a tremendous part of the future of Boulder County. People want to be able to 
consume, eat food that is grown locally and healthily. And I think it's our obligation to try to work towards that um, as fast as we possibly can. At a minimum, that means a few things. Uh, first, it means a, a commitment to continued funding of the open space program, of the, the filling out the gaps within our agricultural lands. It means looking at our infrastructure, the agricultural infrastructure, which um, always needs additional funding, as far as I can tell from our agricultural managers. Uh, but that's everything from the, the, the ditches and the flumes and the diversion structures, center pivot irrigation systems that allow the water to flow, because again, in the arid west, irrigation is tremendously important. It's also processing facilities and other ways for farmers to add value to the crops that they grow. Um, and I think we, we have a lot of work to do on that score as well. It's also finding ways to help um, farmers grow more organic crops on county open space land. It's trying to um, grow farmers themselves. We, we have some programs in place and working very hard to try to teach farmers what they need to, to know in order to run these small, small farms and um, market farms and be successful at it. And then of course we need to do what we can as we manage these lands to make available those opportunities um, to be able to lease out small parcels of land that make sense, that have the right water rights, so that people can um, create something remarkable on those landscapes. So um, I think it's one of the most exciting things we do. I think we're very lucky um, to be in this position. We're also very lucky that uh, just a couple days ago we had another successful open space ballot measure passed by a very narrow margin. But this means that we will have resources going into the future to be able to um, bolster and invest in our agricultural infrastructure and in these lands. And so uh, my, my thanks go out to the voters of Boulder County. Um, we appreciate their support in what, is a, what has been a very tough last couple of years in, in, in the local economy. So we're, we're very fortunate. But with that said, uh, we have some great people to um, hear from. I think this, what we're doing today and what we've been doing over the last number of years is I think the last thing I wanted to mention, which is the engagement of the public in how we manage our lands is tremendously important. And we are deeply grateful for you to be, for being here today. Um, it's a, this, is a, this is a joint project, it's a community project. These are all of our lands and how we manage them matters to all of us. And so we're just glad that we, we were going to have these kinds of discussions and have a citizen advisory board for the cropland policy to work with staff in developing it. And um, this is kicking that off. So thanks everyone for being here today. Back to David. Well, first let me say thank you to the commissioners for showing up today and kicking this off. I appreciate that. And then I want to say welcome to all of you who have um, given up a beautiful Saturday afternoon in November here in Colorado to come in and help us talk about sustainable agriculture in Boulder County. My name is David Bell. I'm the Agricultural Resource Manager for Parks and Open Space. And because we have such a great group of speakers here, I don't want to take too much time, but I think as I heard even our commissioners talking about some of the, the terms that we throw around as far as open space and organic farming and some of the history we've had here, I just want to take a minute to kind of ask how many people have not been a part of the cropland policy conversation until this forum? So that's pretty impressive. So with that being said, I do want to take a few minutes to kind of put this forum in context of what we're trying to accomplish and also kind of put the agricultural program in context of parks and open space because a lot of times when people think about open space programs, they're not thinking about agriculture. So something that is unique and Boulder County again is leading the way in that. So Boulder County protects around 95,000 acres through the open space program. 35,000 of that is through conservation easements. Conservation easements are a program that allows the county to purchase the development rights of a property. And if you think of properties being a bundle of sticks, you can pull out individual sticks with that bundle. You can sell your mineral rights, you can sell your water rights, you can also sell your development rights. So the county has leveraged some of its funds by buying just those development rights and allowing the, the family farmers to keep those grounds and manage them the way they have throughout their family's history. Um, again, protecting the development of those lands because that development is, is held by the citizens of Boulder County. The remaining 60,000 acres we call fee simple properties. This is property that um, 
the county has gone out and found willing sellers who want to negotiate with the county to sell their properties at a fair market value. And then once that happens, we as a county take on that property and the full management of that property. Of those 60,000 acres, um, 25,000 acres were purchased for agricultural values. And as a staff, we don't have the time, the resources, the talent to go and keep those lands in production. So because of that, we partner with local farmers and ranchers to make sure these lands stay productive over time. We call these farmers and ranchers our, our, our partners in conservation. And these individuals lease the land that produces a diverse variety of crops um, for our local markets. They range from barley and beans to kale and corn. And not only do these farmers and ranchers help maintain these lands, but the lease revenues go right back into the open space program. In addition to that, these family farms put mine right back into the community. Um, these family farms not only purchase their seeds, their crop um, insurance, their fertilizers, and stuff from local dealers, they also purchase food, school supplies, and clothes right here in Boulder County. So that these family farms are generating revenue right here in Boulder County as well. Well, we recognize the importance of our, our farmers and tenants on open space. We also recognize that these are public lands and that we as stewards of these public lands are accountable to the public as well. So this is where it puts us today as part of this cropland policy. The park department's in the process of creating this policy, which will help us make management decisions that reflect the public values and sentiments of the public while assuring economic sustainability of agricultural operations and respecting and enhancing the environmental systems that are the foundation of agriculture. This forum is the third in our event to engage the public in this conversation. So again, for those of you, this is your first time, we've also reached out and we've had open houses at the Boulder County Fairgrounds where the public has had the opportunity um, to talk with staff, to talk with farmers about what ranching farming is like in Boulder County. From them, we went ahead and we scheduled tours out in the field. We heard from people that they wanted to get out and see these lands. They wanted to hear from the farmers and ranchers what it was really like out there. So we put, get, put together a tour. On our first tour, we rented a bus. We had 50 people. We went out, we looked at a livestock operation, a row crop operation, and a vegetable operation. Um, those 50 people had a wonderful time. Staff had a wonderful time. And I just know when I got done with those tours, you want to get back on and do it again because it was, I think, a great experience. By the second tour, we had over 100 people. By the third tour, we had over 200 and some people um, signed up for this. And again, by the fourth, we had the public out there and allowed them to see, allowed 400 people to see agriculture in Boulder County Parks in open space. And I think the reaction that I saw from the public was just amazing. It took people back to their childhood of being on farms. It took people that had never been out in a field to see a sugar beer or corn. Uh, the opportunity to get out there and put their hands on the products and walk the fields. And again, I think talking to the farmers was a huge part of that too. This now again is this third piece of this conversation of engaging the public in this conversation of how we manage our public lands for the future. Um, one of the things I want, to be, I want to be clear of to talk about this is we are talking about Boulder County Parks and Open Space lands and this cropland policy. So we're only talking about those lands that are owned in fee by the county. So this is not applied to private lands or conservation easements. So with that background, I'd like to spend a few minutes on the logistics of, of this afternoon's program. So the program you received when you walked in has a lot of the information, so I won't take a lot of time reading bios or reading the event, but there are a couple of things I'd like to go through that might make this go a little smoother since we've started off so smoothly already. Um, there's gonna be three sessions this afternoon, and between each of those sessions, um, there'll be a short intermission. And during this time, you'll have a chance to go and uh, purchase some local foods from the 4-H groups out there. Um, those products were donated by local food uh, merchants, so I'd like to thank Boulder Popcorn, Moe's Bagels, Boulder Chips, Justin's Nuts, Nut Butters, and Seth Ellis Chocolatier. Um, all the proceeds from those sales will go back to this local 4 club. I'd like to thank the kids for selling that as well because when we talk about the future of food, we talk about the future, future of farming, um, those kids really are our future um, for farming in this area. And again, the, the adults who spend time mentoring and teaching these kids. There will also be book sales in the lobby and um, authors will be available to sign those after the event. Well, we encourage you to buy your products. Um, 
please enjoy them out in the lobby because there's no food or drink allowed in here and trying to respect the school and make it easy for the staff. We'd like you to keep your, your snacks in the lobby. Once you're back in the auditorium, please use the index card you were provided to write down questions you would like the panel to answer. And does everyone have their index cards? Does it feel like we have enough pens to write down stuff? Because we can make sure we get that to, to you guys as well. Um, these cards will then be collected by staff and then given to the League of Women Voters. They will go through those cards and then they will be the ones that present those questions and as many of those questions as they can to the panelists um, when we get to the question and answer period of the program. So, with all that being said, and me not want to talk a whole lot up here, um, I want to get on to our, our speakers. So, it's my pleasure to present the authors of tomorrow's table, Organic Farming, Genetics, and the Future of Food. First, Raul Adamchek is an organic farmer and the coordinator at the University of California Davis Student Farm. Pamela Ronald is a professor of plant pathology at the University of California Davis and director of the Grass Genetics at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. Being at what is often considered opposite ends of the spectrum, of the farming spectrum, um, this husband and wife team not only co-authored a book, but are raising two kids and sitting down to, to dinner together and discussing the future of food. I hope that this is a model of our community that we can use to begin a civil dialogue on what agriculture in Boulder County will look like. It is now my pleasure to introduce Pam and Raul. Thank you all for coming today. We appreciate having you here on this beautiful day. And many thanks to David Bell. He's gone to extraordinary effort to um, arrange the symposium. And um, it's been a terrific host. So thank you very much. Uh, so before we start the talk, I wanted to just run a two-minute movie because I, I find it really frames the debate well. You can hit the button.
and we, we know through conversation with friends and colleagues and family members that there, there still remain critical questions about agriculture and, and in particular about genetically engineered crops and organic food production. Many of uh, our friends have asked us if organic agriculture can produce enough food to feed the world and many people have asked us if genetically engineered crops are safe to eat and safe for the environment. So this book is really our response to those questions and what we try to do is take the reader into the lives of an organic farmer and a geneticist so the reader can find out what we actually do and also we try to distinguish between fact and fiction in the debate on crop genetic engineering. So I'd like to introduce my husband Raul who will begin uh, the talk and then I'll jump in in, in a little bit. You might think that an organic farmer and a plant geneticist wouldn't have much in common. But we do, I mean, aside from, from uh, food and the kids and, and uh, love of the outdoors, we also have uh, a sense that agriculture needs to have an ecological basis, needs to be environmentally sound. Yeah, sound of agriculture do we have today? We have one where productivity varies globally in the, in the West. We have a very productive agriculture, feeds everyone, food is abundant, relatively low cost. In Africa and other parts of the developing world, food production is a disaster. There's not enough food being grown, there's malnutrition, there's, there's uh, starvation. Both in the US and Europe and the rest of the world, there are a lot of harmful pesticides being applied. There are soluble synthetic fertilizers, nitrogen uh, being the most commonly applied that contaminate the environment. There's uh, continued soil erosion around the world that's uh, taking cropland out of production. On top of that, um, there are a billion people in the world that are undernourished now, and we expect, uh, demographers expect uh, another two and a half billion people in the world that need to be fed in the next uh, 40 years. We also have, unfortunately, uh, uh, climate change where it's going to impact agriculture with increased flooding and drought. On the left here, those are the Himalayas and the, the glaciers are melting there. They provide water for... Uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, I don't know where those lights came from. The glaciers uh, are providing water for much of South Asia, India, China, where the majority of the world's population lives and needs to be fed. In Africa, there are ongoing severe droughts that have uh, impacted agriculture a great deal, and it's gonna get worse. California uh, has been uh, a model state in, in, uh, in a few ways, one of which is that they keep, they keep track of pesticide use. And this is uh, a graph of millions of pounds of pesticides that have been used in California roughly for the past uh, 10 years. Over those 10 years, there has been 40,000 agricultural acres fewer each year due to urban development and yet pesticide use has not gone down significantly over those years, uh, although there have been a lot of programs that have uh, gotten rid of some of, some of the worst uh, toxic pesticides, but you can see there's still a tremendous amount that are used today. At least in California, those pesticides are used more or less safely and there are on average about a thousand uh, pesticide related illnesses every year in California and it's also been shown that 
pesticides uh, cause uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, can lead to um, Hodgkinson's uh, disease, Alzheimer's disease, and other, uh, other uh, diseases of uh, human beings. Pesticides, of course, also kill a lot of beneficial insects and contaminate water, kill fish. And in California, they're used largely safely in developing countries where 20% 20, uh, 20 of pesticides are used there. They're not used uh, particularly uh, safely. This is, uh, this is a Peruvian potato farmer spraying fungicides on his, his, his potatoes. He has no gloves. He doesn't have a respirator. Those are his clothes he's gonna wear home. And as a consequence of practices like this, the World Health Organization estimates that there are three million cases of severe uh, pesticide poisoning a year that result in 300,000 deaths. Hmm, there we go. Fertilizer runoff, especially nitrogen, affects agricultural systems in the U.S. and around the world. This is the Gulf of Mexico, and on the left, you have a dead ocean, and on the right, you have a living ocean. And uh, this is caused by nitrogen runoff from the Midwest that causes eutrophication. Uh, algal blooms from the, uh, take off from the nitrogen. Microbes break the algae down. They take all the oxygen out of the water, and you get a, a dead, big dead zone. This is a 6,500 square mile dead zone that forms at the mouth of the Mississippi. It's one of 200 major dead zones that form in the U.S. And if you thought that nitrogen use is in decline, it certainly is not. It's been increasing since 1952 and is going to continue to go up around the world. And I say around the world because <laughs> because the majority of nitrogen use these days is in, in the Far East, is in India, China, Bangladesh. Uh, we use our share here in North America, but if we have the environmental problems here that that I've shown you, you can imagine what's going on in, um, in Asia at this point. The third big, big environmental problem generated by agriculture around the world is, uh, is soil erosion. This is uh, an Iowa farm field that is headed for the Gulf of Mexico. And as a result of erosion, um, we're losing 10, 10 million, <laughs> million hectares a year. It's going by itself now. Uh, next slide. There we go. So as a consequence of erosion, we've already lost 30% of the world's arable land. So at a time when we need more land, for more, uh, more food to be grown, we have less. Uh, this, this map shows you the very degraded, so very degraded soils around the world. So with this understanding that we have of what the conventional agricultural system is looking like at this point, Pam and I sat down and thought of uh, criteria for a more sustainable agriculture. And if you did the same thing, you would come up with a, with a similar set, I think, maybe a few other things. But the important parts uh, are that there's a, there are social, economic, and envir environmental aspects to it all. And I've talked about some of the environmental ones, reducing harmful inputs, reducing erosion, improving soil fertility, 
Clearly, we also have to reduce energy use. Uh, for the county, you're talking about local food security, but it's a, it's a concern around the world. Everyone wants abundant, safe, and nutritious food. Economically, uh, the economics uh, are somewhat a two-edged sword. You want to have uh, economically viable farms and sustainable rural communities, but you also want to have affordable food. <laughs> so, as an organic farmer, I think that organic farming has a lot to contribute toward, this, uh, toward our goals of uh, sustainable agriculture. And a lot of them are in the farming practices of organic agriculture. This is um, my farm at UC Davis, and you can see it's, uh, uh, it's uh, diverse in terms of crops, and it's also biodiverse. We have refuges uh, for insects as well. We use crop rotation. We support our beneficial insects and augment our beneficial organisms. We use um, resistant varieties to uh, help avoid uh, diseases. Uh, and as a consequence, our farm and organic farms as a whole have been shown to use 97% fewer pesticides than uh, conventional farms. And this is not to say that uh, we don't have any crop losses, but we've been remarkably successful, and I think organic farmers as a whole have been remarkably successful growing crops uh, with uh, uh, a minimum of, uh, of crop loss. There's been, there's been, there's been re research done also that organic ag uh, reduces nitrogen leaching out of the soil, depending on the study, from 50 to 80 percent, and also depending on the cropping system. And the way that's done is uh, through, through the use of compost, which helps uh, build soils. But another important aspect of compost is that it, it uh, fosters the uh, recycle, recycling of waste out of, uh, out of both agriculture and both uh, urban environments. In California, it was mandated uh, about you know, in the year 2000 that 50% uh, of the waste stream that was going into landfills had to be diverted into something else. And uh, a big chunk of that turned out to be urban green waste that is now being made into compost. There's a local producer that uh, processes a, a thousand tons of green waste a day out of urban areas. Uh, and uh, the majority of that is going out to farms, out to a lot of organic farms, to be uh, used as a nutrient source. The other tool that uh, organic growers use are cover crops to uh, build soil organic matter and add nitrogen. This is a, a crop that grows over the winter in California. It's vetch and bell beans, and it can fix about 150 pounds of nitrogen a year per acre. The, um, I must say, too, that cover crops are not free in that there's the cost of planting the seed, and there's the, uh, the time that the crop has to be in the ground. In California, it's an ideal place to grow cover crops we have, because we have a long winter, the temperatures aren't too cold, and it's, uh, it turns out to be a very good way to add nitrogen and organic matter to the soil. In other parts of the world where the winters are colder or there's, uh, there are dry seasons where things don't grow, then growing cover crops can be more of a challenge. There have been a number of studies that have shown that the use of cover crops and compost helps to build soil 
and reduces soil erosion. These, uh, this is a mix here of, uh, of cowpeas on the left that uh, we planted as a cover crop over the summer, and then we have our, our fall crops, uh, broccoli and kale, growing next to that. So, I've talked about how organic agriculture can reduce pesticide use, provide alternatives to soluble synthetic fertilizers, and help reduce erosion. And so you might ask, well, is that enough? You know, is that all we need to do? Whoops. Let's try that again. Unfortunately, I think the answer to that question is no, and there's a couple of reasons. There are some pests and diseases and stresses that are really difficult to control using organic methods. Um, we have problems with nematodes in many of our soils in California. Um, we have, uh, on the farm, we have an obscure pest called uh, Symphylans very difficult to control. There are viruses that there really aren't organic ways of controlling. And of course there are abiotic stresses, there's drought and flooding that uh, farming practices can only impact so far. Also in organic agriculture that they, there are some, some, uh, some pesticides that are allowed in the organic system that if you were going to start from scratch, you might not allow in, you might not think that they were completely sustainable products. Uh, that includes uh, copper as a fungicide or uh, sodium nitrate as a fertilizer. Um, they're not that uh, uh, benign on the environment. There have been many, many yield studies about organic agriculture, and I could consolidate them by saying, you know, the, the studies have shown that organics, uh, organic systems can yield 45 to 100 percent of conventional systems. And I was an inspector for about 10 years in California and inspected a lot of farms, and for the most part, my observations would be that organic yields are very, very close to uh, conventional yields. But there are some, some uh, farms I visited, like, uh, like rice farms, where yields were, were commonly 50 to 80 percent of conventional because of weed problems that the growers weren't able to manage. And finally, the last one, the uh, the double-edged sword. Uh, I like organic agriculture because it's uh, been able to provide a living for a lot of farmers, a decent living. But the other side of that is that uh, many times organic food has become too expensive for low-income consumers. And that's true here in the U.S., but that uh, if organic food is being grown in, um, in developing countries, it's a different economic situation there. So, this is a slide of, it's a little hard to get a grasp on it, but this is a so slide of an Ecuadorian hillside that's being farmed. And you can see the top there up on the top, and then to me, the side of this hillside looks vertical. <laughs> and, and especially as a farmer that's growing in California on utterly flat ground. This is mind-boggling to me. But we have a situation in the world where the population is increasing. We need more land if we're going to feed people unless we can increase yields on the land that we already have. And it's estimated that without additional yield increases, with the population increasing, that we're going to need a, a doubling of cropland by, by 2050. Well, we don't have a doubling of cropland. It just doesn't 
exist in the world. So the food we need is going to have to come from the land we have already under production. But one pathway maybe to help solve this problem is that presently 30 to 60% 60, 60 of yield is lost to pests, diseases, and environmental stress. So if we can reduce losses, it's, uh, it's the same as increasing yields. So we have a situation where we need to increase yields and we need to do it in an environmentally sustainable way. Plant breeding has been, a, has been the traditional method over the years of both increasing yields and breeding crops that are resistant to pests. And Pam now is going to talk about modern genetic approaches that can uh, help us achieve these goals of uh, sustainable agriculture that we've laid out here. So I want to talk about um, some modern approaches to crop improvement, and in particular how uh, scientists have developed uh, new crops through these approaches to reduce losses to pest disease and environmental stresses. So the first story I want to share with you is papaya ring spot virus. So this is a papaya and uh, plants as animals um, are, can be infected by viral pathogens and these pathogens can be quite devastating. This shows you, you can see these little rings, these are called ring spots caused by a papaya ring spot virus. And this is a very severe disease. And in fact, in the 1950s, the entire Oahu crop was destroyed by papaya ring spot virus. And this is particularly important to Californians because all of our papaya comes from Hawaii. So the farmers had no way to control this disease, no conventional approach, no um, pesticide they could spray, no organic approach. And so what they had to do was move. And they moved to the island of Hawaii, all the papaya orchards. Um, and then, unfortunately, the 1992, the virus was discovered in Hawaii. And very quickly, the production started to plummet. And by 1995, the production had dropped 20-fold, and papaya growers there uh, were facing the complete loss of their industry. And these are small farms. Um, many of the farmers are uh, recent immigrants uh, from the Philippines. So along came Dennis Gonzalez. So he is a local Hawaiian, and he had been very interested in this new concept of that time of genetically engineered crop, crops. And so what he did was take a snippet of a mild strain of a papaya, and he introduced that into the papaya. And in a way, it's like vaccinating the papaya, just as humans go um, to get vaccinated once a year for severe diseases. This is conceptually, conceptually similar and um, has the potential to eradicate certain diseases as we've almost eradicated uh, polio and smallpox. So this was an extremely successful project. I think it's um, getting ahead of itself here. Uh, so I want to go to this, this slide. Thank you. So this shows you his field experiment. And I should say this project was funded by the USDA nonprofit agency uh, for about a cost of about $60,000. So this was many years ago before there were very expensive regulatory requirements. You know, the regulation was essentially, okay, put a fence around your field, um, which is what he did. Uh, and so you can see the transgenic papaya is grown here in the center, and on the outside here is the conventional, conventional papaya. And this is a natural field inoculum, so all the farms in the area look like this, and the transgenic virus can, can, carrying the small snippet of viral um, uh, protein 
It looks like this. And, and I should mention that you can eat the papaya that's infected with the viral ring spot virus, but it has a lot of papaya viral proteins and RNA. Um, and, um, and the main problem then, of course, is for the farmer who can't produce much of it. So this was a very successful project today. 80 to 90% of all Hawaiian papayas is transgenic. And there's still no other method to control this disease. So I also wanted to talk about another very um, severe pest. This is the um, cotton bollworm emerging from his cotton bowl. And uh, he looks pretty ferocious, and he is. It's estimated that 25% of the world's insecticides is used to control this single pest. Now, this then is an excellent target for figuring out how to um, develop genetically engineering approaches, and geneticists took a a page from the book of Organic Farmers because it's been shown for many years that there's a protein called Bt that's produced by a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis that's very effective for controlling uh, this particular pest and it is um, very specific as well. So it doesn't affect non-target insects. So this is now, um, so geneticists took the gene and they introduced it into many crops, including cotton. And this is one of the uh, genetically engineered crops that's grown widely around the world. And this is a, a farmer in Arizona in his field. And there's been some really fantastic studies over the last 14 years showing that an integrated pest management approach is working very well to reduce insecticides and also pre to prevent um, resistance of the insects to this uh, toxin. The BT cotton fields, um, farmers in those fields use half the amount of insecticides than their neighboring farms growing conventional cotton, and they achieve the same yields. And it's also been well documented that there's increased biodiversity as measured by ant and beetles um, species ri richness in these fields compared to conventional fields next door. And it's not hard to understand why, because when you're no longer spraying broad spectrum insecticides, um, the non-target insects can flourish. And it's not only in the United States where this has had a huge effect. This is a farmer in India, and there's been tremendous increases in yield in India and enormous reduction in insecticide uses. And those two um, combinations have led to a very large uh, profit gain. And there's one study showing that these profits are shared um, throughout, throughout the villages in, in a variety of ways. So there's great socioeconomic benefits in, in countries like India. In China, within a couple years of introducing BT cotton, growers were able to reduce use of 156 million pounds of insecticide. And this is significant, so if you recall, uh, Raul said we use about 180 million pounds in California every year, just to give you an idea of how much insecticide was reduced. And this uh, reduction in insecticides correlates with increased health of, of farmers and their families. And um, that was published in Science a number of years ago. So um, I wanted to say that, you know, one common thread through the debate on crop genetic engineering I hear again and again is, well, you know, we don't want to just use seed, you have to use integrated approaches. And that's exactly right. You can't rely on seed to solve all your problems. And it doesn't matter if it's a conventionally improved seed, genetically improved seed, or genetically engineered seed. Seed is seed, and it can only go so far um, for transforming an agricultural system, you also need to have um, very uh, careful farming practices. And that's been shown um, for a lot of studies now with, um, particularly for BT, and many of these studies were led by Tabashnik and his colleagues in the University of Arizona. So for example, in, in China, after these dramatic reductions in insecticide use, other insects began to increase, and that's because farmers no longer sprayed these broad spectrum insecticides, and then there was no way to control these other types of insects that arose. And they've shown in Arizona that other insects can be um, suppressed by many different types of management practices, which really proves that you need to integrate the use of genetically engineered seed with these management practices. And they've also shown in uh, globally that um, you can reduce 
evolution of insects that are resistant to this toxin by doing a, a, a crop rotation, in sort of an integrated program, we plant genetically engineered seed uh, next to non-genetically engineered seed. And again, this is true with any type of seed, whether it's genetically engineered or not. If you reduce the selection of pressure, you can reduce the possibility that insects will evolve resistance. So you really need to integrate um, the best seed that you have with um, ecological-based farming practices. So I just have one slide on herbicide-tolerant crops. These crops have also been planted uh, very widely uh, throughout the globe. And there's, uh, again, for about 14 years, so there's a lot of data about how these crops are behaving. And they have really two major advantages. There's been a shift to the use of less toxic herbicides, and one of these is Roundup. So herbicide-tolerant crops have been genetically engineered with uh, two confer resistance to this herbicide Roundup, which is considered class four non-toxic. And so the growers can um, spray to control weeds um, with this herbicide instead of some of the other herbicides. And I'm sure if there's growers in the audience, they um, can speak, speak to this. Uh, so there's been a shift to the use of less toxic herbicides. And also very importantly, as we showed in this movie, 30% of greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture. So if we can reduce those emissions from agriculture, we can have really a very huge beneficial impact on the climate. And there's uh, one study showing that um, just in the years from 1996 to 2005, the planting of herbicide tolerant crops reduced um, an, uh, a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions, it's equivalent to removing four million cars from the road. This is about 20% of all the cars in England. So I wanted to just finish with um, work from my lab. I've worked on rice for 20 years, and I chose to work on this crop because it's a staple food for half the world's people. And any s incremental small improvements that you can make in um, productivity of rice will really have a very large impact on a, a large number of people. And this just shows you a typical breakfast of a family um, in Mali. They're growing rice porridge. Growing rice porridge, cooking rice porridge. <laughs> And this is um, one point I wanted to make is that rice is um, almost throughout the world, except perhaps in California and some of the other large farms in the United States. It's grown on very small farms of two hectares or less. And this is um, a family uh, farm in Egypt. So importantly, we also need to consider that as the climate changes, large areas of some countries, including Bangladesh, are expected to be submerged. And Bangladeshi people get two-thirds of their total caloric, caloric um, diet from rice. And if you look at these um, kids that are in their, their field, these rice plants will survive the flood, but the ones here will not. And that's because rice likes to grow in water, but if it's completely submerged like this, the plants will die within three days. And this causes um, severe problems in these areas where subsistence farming is, is being carried out. So a number of years, um, oh, and I just wanted to show you, uh, Raul mentioned the, the Himalayas, and those, there's about five great rivers that irrigate this entire area of South and Southeast Asia. So as the climate changes, there's um, increasing flash floods and rapid melting of these glaciers, and it's already creating problems in these countries, um, Eastern India, uh, Thailand, Burma, Bangladesh. And it's critical because 25% of the world's rice is grown in these areas, and this is where a huge um, proportion of the human population is living. So, oh, and I, <laughs> we're fighting back and forth about who's gonna click it. And, uh, okay, so in Bangladesh and India alone, I'm just trying to give you an idea of how much rice is lost every year to flooding. It's estimated that four million tons of rice just in these two countries, enough to feed 30 million people is just lost every year to floods. So this has been an important goal for many years of plant breeders and geneticists to develop new varieties that can withstand these floods. And at about 50 years ago, there was a, an old rice variety called flood-resistant rice that was shown to be highly t tolerant of submergence. And unlike um, all modern varieties grown all over the world, this variety um, 
Could you go back, please? This variety is um, very tolerant of submergence. So we're, uh, <laughs> could you go back, please? I, I think I'll just say next slide, maybe that, and I'll put this thing down. That might work a little better. Um, okay, so what I uh, wanted to say here was that um, this has been an important goal, and this particular variety could stay underwater for 14 days as opposed to three days and then come out alive. So it's almost like this variety can hold its breath underwater. The issue, though, is that this variety has not been used for 50, 100 years because it has very low yield, it has poor taste, and, and farmers in Bangladesh and India have, have, have rejected it. So the idea was to bring this trait into modern varieties, locally adapted varieties, and breeders had tried to do this uh, really for about 50 years, but it's a very complex trait, um, very difficult to introduce a single gene without bringing in a lot of other traits. So in conventional breeding, when you do these crosses, you bring in, you mix large sets of uncharacterized genes, and there's a lot of genes in this whole variety that farmers don't want because it reduces yield, it reduces flavor, it doesn't flower at the right time. And so uh, conventional breeding approaches failed to develop a variety that would be acceptable to farmers. So about 10 years ago, I started working with a rice breeder who's um, now in the International Rice Research Institute to see if we could use the modern genetic approaches of gene isolation, genetic engineering, and precision breeding to develop a new rice variety. My lab was able to isolate a gene that confers tolerance to flooding, and it's called sub-1A for the submergence tolerance one gene. And this shows you some of the experiments in my lab. On the left is the conventional variety, the non-genetically engineered variety um, before submergence. And on the right are the two genetically engineered varieties that we developed. So actually, they're just the um, same genetic background, but um, two different genetically engineered events. And so before submergence, they look fine. And this is really very important because flooding is unpredictable. And so you need to develop a variety that will behave well without floods and when floods are there. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is what the plants looks after 16 days of submergence. The conventional variety is all droopy. It's yellow. It's losing its chlorophyll, which is needed for photosynthesis. It's, it's actually, the leaves are elongated. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's because the, the rice plant is growing very quickly. It's trying to grow out of the water, but it really doesn't have a chance. So the genetically engineered variety on the right are very clever. They're just sitting there thinking, well, we're going to wait till that, see if that flood goes away. It's almost like they're holding their breath underwater. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like seven days after the recovery. And you can see that the conventional variety dies, and the genetically engineered varieties now can regrow, and they'll produce seed. Next slide, please. So uh, my collaborator, David McKill, used this basic knowledge developed through um, genetic approaches to introduce this gene using a very precise approach called precision breeding or marker-assisted breeding. And he was able to introduce this gene into many different genetic backgrounds. Next slide, please. And you can see um, Samba versus Samba sub-1. So this is a field experiment in the Philippines after 17 days of submergence. So you can see the difference between the new variety and the conventional variety, and the same in another genetic back down, background called IR64. So these were very promising field tests um, in a controlled conditions. Next slide, please. And I wanted to give you a time-lapse video to, to give you an idea of the power of genetics um, and again, this is in the, the field in the Philippines, and it's a time-lapse video uh, over four months. And if you click, let's see if this thing runs. So on the left is the new variety that our team developed. On the right is the conventional variety. The flood comes, stays for about 16 days. This is the growth after the flood recedes. And now the varieties on the left are um, the golden grain is um, producing. And in this field test, um, the variety sub one had threefold increase in yield. So I like this slide because it really shows the power of genetics. It's a very small genetic region um, that's been introduced. And it, it, um, importantly, my collaborators showed that the, the field characteristics, which are important to farmers, 
are completely identical. So the difference is really only after flooding. Next slide. So um, Dave led field tests in many fields in India, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. And uh, what you see, I visited, our team visited a couple years ago, and we visited this group of farmers um, in, in India. And on the left, you can see the control field. And on the right, you can see the Sorna sub-1 varieties. And uh, you can understand then why the farmers are smiling. Uh, they're seeing even more dramatic increases in their fields than we were seeing in controlled plots. They're seeing three to five fold increases in field. Um, this is another site in eastern um, India. And then on the lower right is in Bangladesh. And the field tests have been carried out for four years now. And every year um, when floods come, they're seeing four to five increase in yield. Uh, next slide, I have just one more. Um, we also visited a place in eastern India called Orissa. Next slide, please. And this is um, a woman, so it's you know, typical the men are out there doing the field test and women are all in the village, you know, hanging back. So we went over to talk to them and uh, it was really a wonderful experience to get their impression of, of the rice. And if you click, uh, I think it'll, and click one more time. One more click. And so we heard this a lot from farmers, and um, this is really a, was a fantastic program led by the International Rice Research Institute. It was a participatory breeding program, so the scientists and breeders were able to talk with the farmers. The farmers were able to give us their um, input. Next slide, please. So that's really what the, sort of the few examples we wanted to give you. You know, I hope we've demonstrated the power of genetics and the power of seed, as well as the power of farming practices. And I wanted to um, just run through where we are in plant genetics today, because I often realize talking to audiences that it's not really understood what's going on in the world of biology. So this little plant is called a Arabidopsis. It's a model, um, plant, what we call a model plant. It grows in uh, petri dishes that you can grow it from seed to seed in six weeks. So you can do lots of genetic experiments and understand what genes are controlling important um, stresses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one more click. And in the year 2000, the genome sequence was released. And this took seven years, $70 million, and 500 people. And one comment I hear really quite often is, oh, you know, plant genetics is too expensive, and let's put the money elsewhere. Um, but technology uh, changes. And just to give you an example of how, and so this is, you know, pretty expensive. Next year, the same project is expected to take two to three minutes and cost $99. Um, and then I have a couple more images you can click through. So it's not only do we have the Arabidopsis genome, we have the rice genome, we have the corn genome. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the, the cocoa genome was released. Um, we have the, may, we have, um, the wheat genome, genome is being sequenced, and we not only have a single genome from one variety, we're now able to explore diverse genetic uh, diversity um, in many different varieties, and that's critical because there's 80,000 different rice varieties that has been saved in seed banks. Much of that potential biodiversity has been untapped for all the years of breeding because we don't really understand how to get those genes from those varieties into our modern varieties. And so there's a huge push now in plant biology to really tap into that deep genetic reservoir and develop crops that can withstand pest disease um, and environmental stresses. Next slide. So I just wanted to um, have you for a moment imagine your children, your grandchildren, and imagine if we make no changes, if we make no changes to our agriculture, if we, if we think what we have is good enough, um, you know, what that will mean for the world as the population increases, we, do, we have not only um, very little arable land left to farm, we have um, less water available, fresh water available now than we had 50 years ago, and there's no more water that we can generate. And so it is really important that uh, people work together. I really admire what you're all trying to do here and um, talk about many of these important aspects of, of farming and, and seed. And what you do locally will have an effect globally. Um, and I think every farming community needs to be ecologically minded and, and productive. Next slide, please. And, and so this is just um, 
uh, a child, you know, sitting on her bag of rice. And uh, I think I'll just close by saying, you know, we really feel, uh, based on the evidence for many, many years, that it is very possible to feed the growing population in an ecological manner, and that we should use the best science-based information and the best farming practices to accomplish this. So thank you. Well, thank you, Pamela Arwell. And right now we're going to take our first break. If I could get people back in here by 4.30, again, because of the technical problems we had, we're running a little bit behind schedule. So try to be back here by 4.30. We will start it up at 4.30. If our panelists could report up the stage a little bit before that, would be great. And if our techs could come down here and really help us get these mics set up, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you.